Welcome to Law and Crime's Daily Debrief. A new witness is coming forward in the investigation into millionaire pedophile Jeffrey Epstein's web of abuse. Attorney Lisa Bloom represents several of Epstein's victims and says she has a new witness not seen here that the FBI should interview. The unnamed witness apparently says she saw Britain's Prince Andrew at a nightclub with one of Epstein's accusers, a claim Prince Andrew denies. Federal officials want to ask the prince what he knows about any crimes committed by Jeffrey Epstein and about potential co-conspirators. Prosecutors say Prince Andrew has provided, quote, zero cooperation. She does not allege that Prince Andrew uh, abused her in any way, but her story is this. She was there in the nightclub. She stepped on the foot of somebody who was dancing next to her. She said, I'm sorry. He said, that's okay. And the friend she was there with said, don't you realize you just stepped on the foot of a member of the royal family? That's Prince Andrew. She thought to herself, oh my God, I'm in the presence of a royal. She had never been in the presence of a royal before, and she never has been since. So it was a very big moment to her, and it was very memorable. After she was done staring at him for quite some time, she looked at who he was with, and it was a very young girl about her age. And in the photographs that she has seen since, she identifies that young woman as, or girl, I should say, as uh, Virginia Roberts. She saw the interview with Prince Andrew where he denied ever knowing Virginia Roberts, ever meeting her, denied being in the nightclub with her that night, says that photo of her is somehow doctored, although he can't specifically identify how. And she was incensed, and she felt that it was her obligation as a citizen to come forward. One of Epstein's victims who is suing Epstein's estate appeared with Bloom today. That victim, known only as Kiki, says she was recruited and then sexually assaulted when she was 19 years old. She has this message for Prince Andrew. There is no question that you had close ties to Jeffrey Epstein. Dating back to the 90s. My sexual assault occurred in 2004 when I was just 19. Of all people, you had the power to influence and to say something, yet you didn't. Years went by and you didn't. I can't help but think I could have been spared and potentially hundreds of other children, children and young women could have also been spared. Now is your chance to speak to the FBI and do the right thing. And now to testimony in the Harvey Weinstein sex crimes trial, where the discussion in court today centered on other bad acts. The witness who was on the stand today was one of several who testified to bolster the accounts of Weinstein's two primary accusers, Jessica Mann and Mimi Halle. New York public defender and law and crime host Brian Buckmeyer was watching the proceedings for us tonight. Brian, good evening. Good evening, Aaron. So I got to see Lauren Young, one of the Molyneux witnesses, testify against Harvey Weinstein. She described an incident in a hotel, the montage, where she was downstairs with another young woman by the name of Claudia Salinas, having an interview with Harvey about a script that she had written. Now, Harvey, not paying attention, said, let's take this upstairs. Harvey, Lauren, and Selena, they walked into that hotel room where Lauren said she thought she was going to a conference room and didn't realize she was walking not only into his hotel room, but to his bathroom until she didn't know what was going on. Now she's saying that she walked in and Harvey had taken all of his clothes off faster than she's seen anyone else take off her clothes and that Claudia remained outside, outside of an opaque door where she could see her silhouette. Harvey then removed all of his clothes, got into the shower, quickly rinsed off. She was against the sink at this time. Now Harvey approached her. She turned around because he was naked and she didn't want to see that. When she turned around, she said that Harvey unzipped her dress pulled it down and in a way that kind of trapped her arms at her side. Now when this happened, she turned around and she said that Harvey with one hand grabbed her chest and with the other began to touch himself. She, he then reached for her sexual parts and she batted him away. At that point in time, she, he continued until she quote, finished. And that's when she was able to run out of the room and escape her assailant. A graphic description from the witness stand there, Brian. So the purpose of this witness is basically not to prove a charge beyond a reasonable doubt, but to back up the two primary accusers in this case. How is the jury reaction, reacting rather to all of this, Brian? 
So there's a lot of ebb and flow. At one point in time, we saw a picture that Lauren Young had drawn um, of Harvey Weinstein while naked. Now that picture was not displayed to the rest of us, but it was passed <coughs> around the jurors. Some jurors examining it very quickly, one or two giving quite the grimace as they looked at the naked body of Harvey Weinstein with a similar description that Jessica Mann had given, again, having many scars, bumps, and some deformities and looking like he was missing some of his genitalia. And what do we expect to happen next, Brian? So the cross-examination was still going on at about 4 o'clock when I left the courtroom. What I would anticipate is that they would continue to keep her on the stand, again, doing the same thing they did with Jessica Mann, trying to lock down what day this happened, and then trying to say, hey, there was an email that happened before, an email that happened after. You're obviously still engaging and trying to get some sort of benefit from his relationship. They'll try to discredit this Molina witness as best as they can. It appears the prosecution is winding down and ending their, their case in chief, and we might see a case put on by the defense. Long Crimes Brian Buckmeyer in the Weinstein courtroom for us today. A bit of an aside now, attorney Lisa Bloom, who we heard from a moment ago, once worked with Harvey Weinstein. We couldn't help but ask her about that this morning. Well, I have said many times that in the past I did occasionally represent accused people. I no longer do that I, uh, after I withdrew from the Weinstein matter when the first woman went on the record and accused him of sexual assault. And I hope that justice is done in that trial. To Connecticut now where one of two remaining defendants in the case of a missing woman is replacing her attorney. Michelle Draconis is charged with conspiring to murder Jennifer Dulos. Co-defendant Fotis Dulos committed suicide last week. Draconis has fired attorney Andrew Bowman, seen here with her in court, and replaced him with John Schoenhorn of Hartford. Schoenhorn wants any trial to move to a different county in Connecticut and away from Fairfield County. And to Ohio now, where we heard opening statements today, or rather we enter the second day of testimony in the trial of a man accused of raping and murdering a young woman after living a life of crime. Anthony Pardon is the defendant who promised to represent himself until accepting the help of attorneys at the last minute. Victim Rachel Anderson was aspiring funeral director. Authorities say Pardon killed her on her 24th birthday, January 28th, 2018. Co-workers called the police when Anderson did not show up. Officers found her dead in her bedroom closet, stabbed through the back of her neck by a blade that went into her skull. The victim's younger brother offered this strange testimony about why his DNA was on the victim's towel. She said, or he said rather, that he visited her and then went to a club in Columbus with friends to celebrate her birthday. Later on, we're going to hear about some evidence collected from Rachel's house um, and a, a bathrobe that has some of your DNA on it. Okay. Okay. Um, can you tell me how it got there? Um, I did my uh, childly business in her bathroom because okay. I wanted to be respectful about that. And uh, I used that towel, well, bathrobe at the time, I thought it was a towel to you know, clean myself. And then after that, I went back upstairs to take a shower and I reused that same bathrobe as a towel. What'd you guys do to celebrate Rachel's birthday? Uh, we basically hung out in his, uh, his little living room area and uh, smoked some weed, drank like normal. Um, basically, after that, we got an Uber to a club. Uh, I don't know where the club was at or the name of it, but we went somewhere downtown and then we were there for maybe an hour to two, and then we actually came back to John and Tina's apartment, which where I fell asleep. Did Rachel dance? Yes. Everybody else dance? Yes. Have a nice time? Yep. One of the people out that night was Jonathan Kennedy. At one point, the victim's brother gave Kennedy's name to a detective as a possible suspect. The defense wanted to know a lot about that. I didn't strongly suspect him, but I did give out John Kennedy's name at that time. Okay. And, and why did you give out John Kennedy's name as a suspect? Uh, I believe John was like the only one that knew her down there. Didn't you tell the detective that there had been a huge falling out between Jonathan and Tina Kennedy with your sister drug-wise? Uh, no, that isn't exactly what I meant. It was more of, I know they had a drug thing together, the LSD trip. But other than that, no, there was no significant falling out. You did, in fact, suspect Jonathan Kennedy, didn't you? Yes. And there was a reason you suspected Jonathan Kennedy, wasn't it? Yes. And that reason was because of a conversation that you and your sister had 
about two weeks prior to the birthday party? I believe two weeks, yes. And during that conversation with uh, your sister, she had indicated to you that she was afraid of John Kennedy, didn't she? Yes. You indicated to the uh, Detective Wells that you were surprised that they were even throwing her a birthday party. Um, I wasn't really surprised, but I was surprised that, that that was all happening that weekend. According to your sister, he had sexual vibes for her. Yeah, as in he does have a thing for her. She, he does think she is an attractive woman. The victim's brother went on to testify about an alleged LSD trip where this other person, Jonathan Kennedy, developed feelings for his sister, and Kennedy also had a key. Who had taken the acid trip? I believe it was my sister, John, and Tina. That's when sexual vibes happen, right? I believe. Okay. And um, so much so that it caused your sister fear and discomfort? To an extent, yes. She was worried about the fact of, like, him trying to, you know, maybe break up with his girlfriend and, you know, pursue her. You also talked about, um, in terms of Jonathan Kennedy being a suspect, you were, you said he found the body, right? Yes. Okay. And you, uh, in fact, indicated to the detective, well, how did he get in, right? Yes, I did ask him. Because you knew he had a key, didn't you? I knew he had a key, yes. Okay. You believed... The only key was your sister's and the key that he had, right? Yes. Let's join our three guests tonight. Ashley McMahon is in Georgia. Gilbert Paris and Terry Austin are with me here in New York. So, Terry, I love that cross-examination because you could basically flip a state's witness and almost turn that witness into a defense witness. I don't think it was badgering. It wasn't loud. It was just straight to the point. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I thought that she did a great job cross-examining him, she actually made a foundation for some reasonable doubt here that Pardon could have been the one who did it because this other person, Kennedy, might have had some motive to actually commit this crime. I'm wondering about that, Gilbert. Is this an actual viable third-party culpability suspect here that we're starting to hear from? Because we've got good state evidence in this case. We've got the defendant's DNA. We've got the defendant's phone at the crime scene. We've got the defendant apparently caught on video using the victim's credit card somewhere after the victim was killed. So all roads, at least from what we were hearing, pointed to this defendant. So what about this other guy? Uh, well, remember the defendant actually wrote a letter to the news station saying that he had gotten high uh, with the decedent here. So I think what the defense is going to do is say the defendant might have actually been there using the excuse that he was there voluntarily, but he wasn't the one that committed the murder. And they're right now developing that theory of, well, who did? It was one of these other people. Okay, so let's talk about whether or not uh, this is going to roll along in benefit of the defense or not. Ashley, your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, as a defense, you've got to provide the jury with any other reasonable, and no matter how remote that that reasonableness is, uh, any other reasonable suspect. This guy had uh, what sounds like potentially a motive and also opportunity by having a key to the apartment. I think that's exactly what they're setting up, and that's exactly what I would be doing if I was defending Mr. Pardon in this case as well. And remember, the defense set this case up by saying, jurors, you need to look at reasonable doubt and take that oath seriously. And still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, day two of testimony in the killing of a young Dallas mother. Officers approached the car she was sleeping in, and as the car began to move, two officers began to fire. Is it self-defense or is it a crime? Day two of testimony in the case against a Dallas police officer who fired his weapon 12 times while on duty and killed a young woman. Prosecutors are trying to convince a jury that Officer Christopher Hess acted illegally when he fired on 21-year-old Genevieve Dawes. The charge is aggravated assault by a public servant, and it carries a possible 5 to 99-year prison sentence. This is Officer Hess's body camera footage of what happened. A neighbor called 911 because Dawes and her partner were sleeping in a car. The occupants tried to take off by backing up, driving forward, and then backing up again. That is when officers opened fire. Police say they were suspicious because at one point the vehicle was reported stolen, but there were no charges filed against the surviving occupant related to a stolen vehicle. Let's listen. What's up? 
They ran the squad car twice. The man who called 911 indicated that he believed no one was in danger as the victim and her common law husband began to leave. As the vehicle was backing up the second time, uh, that first officer did clear, but the second officer uh, barely cleared within just a second or two, and then the vehicle rolled back and they opened fire. Could that vehicle have hurt one of those officers if it had hit them? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, at that speed, my opinion now, because that's probably an issue I have there at the apartment. People driving or backing out too fast, and uh, it doesn't take much with a three or four thousand pound vehicle to injure someone, in my opinion. Yes, and in your opinion, the driver of that vehicle seemed desperate to get away. My opinion, yeah, yeah. You use the word desperate. Why do you say desperate? Well, they were blocked in, surrounded, outnumbered. I won't say outgunned because the officers didn't know, I'm sure, what was in the vehicle. And their main focus was on the vehicle. Investigators inspected the officer's weapons to determine who fired and how many bullets were fired. First, they looked at Officer Hess's gun. His box magazine was empty, and he had one uh, cartridge in the chamber of the weapon. Do you know how many uh, rounds his magazine held? Yes, I do. It, it held 12. 12 rounds? Correct. So for a total capacity of the weapon, including the magazine and the chamber, we're talking about 13 rounds? Yes, sir. That'd be correct. And uh, I think you just testified that his magazine was empty. Is that correct? His magazine was empty. And there was one in the chamber? Correct. Um, did he have any extra rounds on him? He had two more magazines that were both full. Officer Kemper. Uh, Kemper. Kemple, Kemple, I'm sorry. Did you do the same process with him? I did, exactly the same. What were the, result, the results of your inspection of his weapon? He had one in the chamber and 14 out of 15 in his magazine. Okay, so a 15 uh, capacity magazine? Correct. And one was missing from the magazine? Correct. What about the other officers? Their, uh, inspected their weapons, did the same thing. But their weapons were all uh, full. They hadn't been fired. Former Los Angeles Police Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey has been analyzing the police tactics in this case. She offered these observations. A neighbor called because there were people sleeping in a car. A neighbor called. The police were given the information. I would imagine they probably ran the license plate before they arrived and found out that the car was stolen. Now, the fact that the car had been reported stolen doesn't necessarily mean that it could not be the owner in the vehicle because it's not uncommon for someone to report their car stolen, see it, and then recover it themselves and neglect to tell the police, oh, by the way, I found my car. We had a situation here in Sonoma County, California, where that very same thing happened. Man reported his car stolen. It was taken by a caregiver. He was able to get it back and never notified authorities. And so listen, this is a 10-year vet. He should know these possibilities. He should understand that there are all sorts of variables, and sometimes just because we're given information through dispatch doesn't necessarily mean that it's so. And so poor tactics, poor planning leads sometimes to unnecessary use of deadly force. I'm bothered by the fact that it sounds like they're going to try to dirty up the victims, uh, the defense. They're going to bring in their past history. They're going to talk about um, you know, the fact that this car was uh, allegedly reported stolen. But what's interesting to me is that while the car was reported stolen, um, Mr. Rosales was never charged with being in possession of a stolen vehicle. So I'm, bo I'm bothered by that. Let's turn to our guests one final time tonight. Ashley McMahon is with us remotely tonight. So, Ashley, after watching that video for yourself, who do you think has the upper hand here? Do you think that this is a crime or do you think it's self-defense? Because that's what legally it's going to boil down to. 
Well, here's the problem. I mean, those videos uh, speak more than any witnesses ever will be able to on the witness stand. And in the video, to me, in my opinion, if I'm a juror sitting there, it just doesn't look like they are about to ram that vehicle. You know, it looks like they back up a little bit and then maybe somebody in the vehicle gets hit and then they back up a little bit more. It doesn't look like the crazy, you know, escape that most people are expecting to see on this video. And unfortunately, and that's going to speak for all the witnesses in this case. Exactly. That's the way I thought of this. I said yesterday that it reminded me of someone backing out of a parking spot after brunch on Sunday or something like that. Gilbert Paris, do you agree with me, disagree with me? I agree 100%. Looking at the video, it actually disturbed me so much. Even here in the studio, I had to make an explanation. I mean, the car was backing out. What appeared to me, not necessarily slowly, but definitely not fast, not in that abrupt, jerky manner. The officer from the distance and the angle that he was firing didn't appear that he was in fear of his life in any means, in any manner. I find it quite disturbing, and I agree with both of you 100%. Terry Austin, of course, we also have the legal theory of self-defense of another. Now, can the officer get up on the stand and say, hey, wait a minute, I thought my partner was over in that area, so I'm focusing on the vehicle in case a weapon is brandished, and then I'm thinking my partner is right there behind it. Does that testimony trump what we saw in the video? And does it match up with what the 911 caller said that the other officer got out of the way, but it was a few seconds before the car backed up? Aaron, I think you hit it right on the head. I think they are going to put the officer on the stand. I think he's going to explain his actions. He's going to say he was defending the entire crew. You've already heard a little bit about the fact that he was looking out for everyone. He was calling for an ambulance. He was making sure the whole group knew what was going on. So I do think they're going to try to say that he was trying to protect everyone on the scene. And ultimately, Terry, what do you make of it? Do you think that it ultimately boils down to illegal conduct or do you think that there's a justifiable shooting here? I could go either way with here, Aaron. I think it was overkill. He didn't need to shoot, you know, 13 times or 12 times. He could have shot the tires out for that matter if he thought the car was going to move. So I would lean, you know, in favor of uh, the prosecution here. De-escalation tactics, uh, according to Terry Austin here. Okay, we need to wrap things up on the debrief tonight. I've been with you on both ends of the clock here during our live coverage. I'll be back here tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening.